embroidery, but not as you know it. Richard McFedis is a contemporary artist living and working in London. Obsessed with process, Richard uses traditional hand stitch techniques and mark making as a way to make sense of the world by mapping time and space. Probably best known for his monochromatic style and series of embroidered sculptures in the form of cubes, he has taken one of the world's oldest crafts and transformed it into something astonishingly contemporary. Richard is a self-proclaimed perfectionist and his designs suggest a highly disciplined approach. But if you take the time to look really closely at his work, you may be surprised at the randomness and imperfection of each tiny stitch. It's like a gift to those that take the time to slow down and really appreciate the time and tenderness that has gone into every piece. Richard's artwork has been celebrated in galleries, art fairs and museums across the world, including Iceland, Ukraine, Pakistan, South Korea, to name just a few. He has taught extensively and has been invited to run masterclasses at a number of institutions, including the Royal College of Art, where he graduated in 2008. We are lucky to spend this time with Richard this evening. So without further ado, let's get started. Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. Good evening. <laughs> what a nice video. That was lovely. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for supplying those gorgeous videos and images. It's just what a treat. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, it, I, I don't know what to say. It was really nice. It was very nice when someone else talks about your work in, in a very eloquent way. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And um, I, I enjoy writing. Like, I, I spend a lot of time researching and and trying to write something that's meaningful not not just a copy of someone's bio necessarily yeah. but you know that actually speaks like i just feel that your work's worthy of just slowing down and actually looking at it and although from the outside looking in a lot of things look perfect but actually when you take the time to look they're not so and that's what i love about your work i think too that, oh thanks yeah, not 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 that it's not perfect. It's, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> just backtracking. Perfect. I'm trying. No, the the attempt is there to be perfect, but yeah, I think perfection is never achievable. I don't think. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a really hard um, sort of thing to strive for. Um, I'm more meticulous than than uh, than a perfectionist, I would say. Ah, very good. Yeah. Well, of course, we've got the beautiful Noni. Hello, Noni. <laughs> Noni. Hello. <laughs> Noni's such a big fan of your work, and I know you guys connect over your embroidery and stitching. So yeah. Cool. And then Richard, uh, sorry, Glenis Mann's here. So lovely to oh, see you. Oh, what a team. They're dream yeah. team. Yes. Oh, I'm and Marion, our gorgeous friend, Marion. Hi, Marion. Marion's um, in New oh, Zealand. Oh, I know Carrie. And Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> She's done. Oh, wine to celebrate. It's too early for wine here. Yeah, no, you've got your gin, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, for my pretend, for pre pretend gin. Beautiful. Oh, and Jeannie. Hi, Jeannie. <laughs> Hi, Jeannie. And the beautiful Lorna Crane as well. Hi, Lorna. So everybody who's watching, if you've got a question for Richard, please pop it in the comments and we'll try and get to get to them if we can. I've got a few questions to ask you myself as well. Oh, Susan as well. Just pop up Susan. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Susan's lovely. She's always on there watching. And she a lot of people have said that these sort of interviews and and doing interviews on a Friday night and connecting with all these wonderful artists has been really great for them. And I know you've done heaps of interviews lately as well. How has that process been for you? Um, do you know what? It's been okay. Um, do you know what I really dislike is like looking at my own face so much. <laughs> this is the time of the year that we're in, you know, this period is like there's way too many Zoom calls. And so I, my work is my public face so um i i like to be the sort of the quiet person behind it but it's been really really interesting and really great to connect with people and i'm very humbled that so many people want to hear me talk about my work so it's it's been a real 
Um, I mean, I think the past three months, four months have been very difficult, I think. Um, and I'm lucky that I've had my work to sort of um, sort of dig into and keep me sort of sane, um, not always. Um, and I think people always look to, maybe look to artists to, for, I don't know, inspiration or different ways of looking at the world. And I think that's what we need right now is to take a little bit of time and stop and relax and slow down and appreciate um, everything that we already have um, and not what we've lost because it, I'm sure it's going to be just a short time but yeah so I've, I've met lots of really interesting people and the good thing about this is I get to talk to loads of people from all around the world so it's been really 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 great yeah oh that's awesome I know it takes a lot of energy and a lot of um yeah preparation and 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 I know I always get a bit nervous before going live as well so yeah and I really appreciate your time and yeah so in your definition, I know your work, and we'll get to your work about how it is related to time. But first of all, I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what is time? Oh my God, that's a difficult question. Um, well, I'm not a physicist, and uh, I can only tell you my limited experience of it. Um, uh, I mean, that's what I've been trying to ask in my work for a very long time. I'm very interested in this idea of time and what what actually it is and yet it's this sort of force in our lives which dictates most of it it's it's so powerful in the way it organizes our lives and yet it's invisible I mean we only see it through change so I like to see time more as change so we know things are happening because oh, we get older we get gray hair or the weather changes or the seasons change so for me time is about change um, but time is also like a cultural thing for us. It's the way we organize our lives. Um, and I think I read this really fantastic book called Timekeepers by Simon Garfield. I don't have it with me. Um, yeah, Timekeepers by Simon, Simon Garfield, if you want to read it. And it was more of um, a look at time in terms of culture and how time is really um, quite a new phen phenomenon to us. Although we've been sort of obsessed with it, um, it's more... Um, more important now, I, I would say, in the last 150 years since since probably the Industrial Revolution. And I learned this from the book, so it sounds like I know it all, but I don't. I just read it from the book, and um, and it was it began with the the trains really, and getting all these trains to run on time. And because you know, when we looked at time, different locations have different times. So in the UK, Bristol might have had a different time to London. So it was all really about efficiency and making people work longer. So. Um, I've got a very sort of pessimistic view of time because really it's it's been about making us work harder, be more productive. But in the sort of philosophical sense, um, time is very individual to all of us. Um, and we've all been there, you know, when summer holidays as a kid last really long or when you're in a specific process of doing a specific task, it might go really quickly or slowly. So I'm very interested in that very subjective time. I mean, I don't think there is a real answer to time because time means different things to different people. If you ask a physicist, time, I mean, I'm sounding like I know what I'm talking about here, but quantum physics, like time is very granular. It's like lots of little events, um, but then time, is yeah it's just a really abstract idea and I think that's what I'm trying to figure out in my work I don't think I'll ever arrive at the correct answer it's 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 too big to deal with and um you know I make work in order to try and make sense of that and I'm not sure I'll ever get to that correct answer mm, I love that idea of time being an emotion so you know yeah you can be involved in something and time just slips away but then at other times, like, you know, it could be, you know, a child running in front of a car and then that those couple of seconds could seem like a lifetime, you know, like, yeah, like, oh. <laughs> yeah I love that idea of concept. And I, and I think during this whole period of lockdown and COVID, I think our perception of time has really changed. I mean, I have, I mean, this week I felt like it's been Friday every single day and I've had to double check my calendar because I've lost that sort of routine. Um, and also because everything has felt really new, I feel like I've been transported back to when I was a kid and having my summer holidays. You know, when, when summer lasted only for six weeks, but felt like it went on for three months. And I feel like um, that period of time has gone, it's been a bit like that. And yet I still can't quite remember what's just happened. It, I mean, it's gone really quickly and yet I feel like it's been a lifetime. 
So it's a very interesting thing. And actually time, when you think about it um, in a scientific way, is also um, subjective and also it's different for every single person because as objects, we we change and distort time around us. So time is different for each of us. And this is proven. Um, so the further, I think the further you get away from the sort of planet, the faster time or the slower time goes, that's it. So if you were to send, send someone out to the top of a mountain, um, they would age slower than someone closer to the earth. So it's a proven fact that time is very specific to each of us and we all distort and change time only very fractionally. So there are lots of different aspects which I think are quite exciting and almost mind blowing. I mean, every yeah, there was a there's a, a, a podcast called um, Infinite Monkey Cage. If you ever want to listen to it, um, and the, their last episode is, or oh, I can't remember what it's called. Does time exist? And my mm. mind totally like blew away with what they were talking about. So uh, it's exciting and also frightening. Um, yeah, and it puts everything a little bit in perspective for you. That's awesome. And we'll put some links in the comments as well. We've put a link up about um, the timekeepers. The, the yeah, how's your mind now with your times exists? <laughs> Sorry, I, what did you say? I was like, yeah, you definitely need wine when you want to listen to that podcast because you will really not. I mean, I was just totally bonked. Yeah, totally blown away by it. Yeah, exactly. So how is time reflected in your work? Um. So I've always been really interested in that idea of time. And I think textiles is quite an interesting material in which to communicate time. I mean, in when you look at fashion, for instance, um, fashion immediately communicates an era or, or a point of time. You could look at something and say it's 70s inspired, 60s inspired. So there's that perception of time in terms of culture and the way you look at fashion, but also in the process, it communicates time. So um, if something's been made by machine or it's been jackal woven, you know um, through experience that that is a quicker process than say something that's been made by hand. Um, and I like the idea of this communication of time. I mean, quite often a lot of my work is made in response to a specific moment. Um, I made a piece of work called um, Five O'Clock Shadow. Looks a really bad. Oh, anyway. This is five o'clock shadow. I don't have a picture for you, but it was made specifically in response to that idea of time. So it's my shadow on the floor at five o'clock. But then also it communicates our idea of bodily time. You know, the time, um, um, the hidden, the hidden times so when a man's sort of beard grows. You know, the five o'clock shadow. So it sort of links that way. But I was really interested in showing time, almost like. Um, like little dots. So I, my process is, is, is I use multiples of dots and lines and crosses, but the dots specifically are like punctuations. So they represent like moments of time, like you would use a comma or a full stop. They, they, they allow a, a breath. So I'm using these dots as a, as a signifier um, for sort of live time. And I'm sort of transforming, transforming that idea of time into the material. So freezing it so that it becomes like this moment um, frozen in an object in time. So, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to sort of grasp the idea of time, my time specifically, um, trying to sort of capture that into something physical and tactile and tangible because you can't touch time. It's not, it's not there. It doesn't, it doesn't exist as a physical object. Um, and yet it has this huge sort of power over. So yeah, my work is about sort of transforming that idea of time into something, into a material form. I wanted to ask you about your work, Variations of a Stitched Cube, and you can talk a little bit more about it, but what I was fascinated with was that, I mean, you talk about it and then I'll, I'll ask the question, all right, I'll ask the question. Yeah. But I do want you to talk about your own work, but yeah. my understanding is that you created 60 cubes yeah. and one one cube was one hour and then it went up by an hour. So the next cube you, you took was two hours, mm -hmm. three hours, four hours, up to 60 hours. Yeah. So if my calculations are correct, they're probably wrong. That's 1,830 hours of stitching. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Which yeah. equates to 76.25 full days, 24-hour days. Yeah. So if you broke that down into an eight-hour working day, that's 
228.75 days, right? Yeah. And then I thought, okay, so you've got some, you know, your weekends and, you know, all the rest of it and ho holidays. You took some That's a whole year, right? A whole yeah. year's worth of work. Before you decided to do that project, <laughs> that work, did you do those calculations? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think if I'd done those calculations, I might have not done the project at all. I'm really happy that you figured that out. I knew that I'd stitch for 1,800 something hours. I did that final calculation at the end. And um, that doesn't involve the time spent cutting them out and then stitching them together. That that time is just the time making the, 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 black, the black stitches. So, yeah, it was a really epic project. Um, I made it. Yeah, I made it in response to um, sort of this continuation about exploring time, but I wanted to set myself some rules. I was very inspired by a piece of work by Sol Lewitt, where he was, um, it was a piece of work called Variations of an Incomplete Cube. You can see I totally stole that title there. Um, but I, um, so that was the inspiration. But then also I was doing a lot more research into this idea of time and what it was that, you know, what were the numbers that sort of governed our lives? And it was this magic number 60. So I made, a, so I love a rule. So I set myself some rules and, and Sol Lewitt is really famous for setting himself rules like drawing. So you can recreate a Sol Lewitt drawing by following some set rules. So that's why a lot of his work has been reproduced in museums and galleries like drawings um, because he sets rules. For him, it's about the idea, not the execution. Whereas for me, it's a, it's a mix of both, like doing the final piece of work seeing the evidence of the hand, but then also these sort of ideas and rules. So I designed that piece of work really, and I designed it, if I'm being honest, I knew exactly what it was gonna look like. I mean, obviously the stitches, I didn't know what it would look like, but I designed the sort of the way it was gonna be displayed, um, the sort of dimensions of it all before. So the height of the, the whole unit, so the sculpture part, um, and then the width, the spaces in between, um, all were composites of this number 60. So when you look at the number 60, it is the most highly composite number. And, you know, it governs our lives, 60 seconds, 60 minutes. In financial calendars, it's still 360, six times 60. So this number 60 has been really um, prevalent in our, in, in our whole culture and life since the Sumerians and Babylonians. They use this number 60. So it's this sort of magical number which has um, governed our whole lives. So I wanted to make it almost alter or the sort of homage to this number 60. So the whole piece is a, is, is a reflection and an investigation into this magic number 60. And then each of the cubes were all 60 by 60, so 60 mil by 60 mil. So I just kept on reusing this number. Um, and then I was recording like what time would be like for set amounts of time. So one hour, two hours, so in increments of 60. Yeah, I mean, it was a physically mentally quite draining project and had i if i was ever going to do it again which i will not for sure is i might have done it the other way around so i started at one and worked my way up to 60 and actually what i should have done is started at 60 and went my way down because then i felt like i was achieving something i mean i was running out of time literally i think i finished the day before that that project um sort of ended but what i loved about this is just the randomness of embroidery recording my time and then what you get are these very abstract patterns of time on each cube, like almost little islands, topologies of time, each one different. So you can see how, and I made them all as flat objects. So when I then transformed them into three dimensional objects, they sort of transformed and turned into something completely different and unintentional. And I love that sort of randomness, but the randomness is then contained within this cube. And that's what's really um, comforting about the cube. It's a is the cube and the and the square is almost a rational way to organize and make sense of something so infinitesimal is that a word um as time you know and that's my time you know i think i actually worked hard i re worked really hard that was, i think it was like over nine months i worked on that piece of that that work and um yeah it was it was a it was a it's a challenging program um i mean a challenging challenging piece of artwork but that, that, that it was a really great challenge. And I think sometimes you need to sort of make those big sort of um, expressions as an artist to, to sort of really challenge you. And, and that piece has gone on to really sort of, you know, cement me in a certain certain realm of sort of craft and, and, and fine art. So it was a really challenging 
um, process, but also um, I learned a lot about my own sort of mental stamina to keep going through that. And I had a job. I had a full time job. I was a mess. What? Yes, I How was. Did you do um, that? I was a physical. I was not a nice person to be around. <laughs> I was a physical you know, on my lunch breaks on the train to the work, train to the office. Uh, I was working till like five in the morning. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, a mess. So I've learned um, not to do that ever again. I decided. And and that's just incredible because you know that's eight hours a day. That's two hundred and twenty eight point seven five days of stitching with a full time job. <laughs> Yeah, I was really, I was, it was, it was having two full time jobs. Yeah. Wow. So any spare moment I had, I was working on this, on this project. Yeah. Really, really mm -hmm. challenging. Yeah. Was it after that? Oh, first, first of all, do you think that you would have done it if you didn't have a deadline? No, I think, um, I mean, deadlines are great things for artists. I think sometimes, um, I mean, that's maybe probably what I'm missing right now is to have that sort of, motivation or that thing to aim towards and lead towards and i think um having something like i applied for an exhibition that i made that piece of work specifically for an exhibition in 2017 which was collect um and uh, the the premise of that exhibition was called collect open they wanted works that would challenge the idea of what craft was um, but then also really to challenge you as an artist so i wanted it to be a challenging piece of work um, and i wanted it to be big even though I don't really believe in sort of big work, because just for the sake of it, it was made up of lots of small objects. I mean, I can't make big work. Obviously, I can with that bit there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I possibly would have achieved the same amount if I had not had that sort of deadline to, to strive for. And also, I'd applied for funding and got funding from that, from the Arts Council here. So there's a lot of pressure there to sort of realise. I mean, there's no there's no room to fail. And sometimes you need that pressure i quite like a deadline um yeah i'm working on um like a video um for um a museum and uh, the deadline is today <laughs> so uh, um i finished it this morning obviously and uh, <laughs> so that that sort of helps uh yeah i love a I do i do love a deadline so it might seem like i'm really organized but you know i can't rush my work you know i had to that that piece of work i had to start and do and it took a set amount of time there, there's no way of moving that i was very limited by this and i like that sort of pressure um yeah it was really interesting i've made a video talking about that piece of work and it's on my website and um, i think it's under things and film and um yeah it's very candid about how i felt after i made that project fantastic i've got a couple of questions from the audience um did the 60 morph into the next project from glennis um did it i can't remember what i made that sort of you know when you go through trauma and then you can't remember something that happens after my memory from that period is gone i think um i started to make a big piece of work called particles or landscape i keep changing the title so it's a big one meter piece um and again um sort of big circular piece but this one had no rules other than just to let the process take over and just stitch so it's quite planetary. You can see actually on my board here that I'm sort of into the circles at the moment, circles and squares. And um, yeah, so that's that sort of morphed into that piece. And that's going to be a sculptural piece as well. Because um, for me, it's really, I, as much as I love two dimensional stuff, me, I love objects and three dimensional things. When I'm making something, I don't, it, it comes to life then in a space. Yeah, I really like space and I love sculpture and I want my object to be sculpture as well. So it's it's an important part of the presentation of the piece of work that, that it then, you know, comes to life in a space, almost like a performance piece so that you can walk around it and it can interact with it. Because, you know, these objects sort of emit something and have a conversation and dialogue with different parts of rooms. I mean, I, that's a lot of my inspiration is from architecture and our relationship to it or our, our relationship to any sort of space and how we move and navigate around it. I mean, I think one of my key skills is that I, I, I know how to organize space. I'm, a, uh, I'm an organizer and so organizing space two dimensionally, but then also three dimensionally. Um, so that's what I like to sort of do with my object. So I'm making that sort of big piece at the moment. I've shown it in um, one gallery already and then I'm planning to show it um, 
in um oh well i don't know i was meant to have a solo show my first one and it got postponed so waiting to hear when it'll be back on but it's not it's not cancelled and that will that will form the center point of it if anyone's been following me on sort of instagram i've been um um posting um pictures of sandbags and you know those road signs which are really weighted so the mm. idea is that piece is going to be i'm almost going to make it into it looks like a road sign um so that because the idea i'm trying to explore is this idea of space time and gravity and the sandbags for me show gravity in this really wonderful way the way they sort of drop and um, you know slouch and they show almost weight and gravity within that so the idea is that the people will you know be in a space and react with it will show time in terms of the the marks that i'm making but then also the way it's weighted down with the sandbags will um yeah sort of communicate that idea of these three fundamental forces in our life so i'm very interested in science at the moment i mean i'm not a scientist and i don't quite understand it it goes a little bit over my head but art for me is a way of trying to make sense of all that. And I think it's a really fun way to sort of investigate um, the world. Mm. Fascinating. I can't wait to see it. I hope they put it online so we can all see it. Oh, well, I'm sure I'll just Instagram the hell out of it. So you'll, you'll see it all. <laughs> awesome. We've just put a link up to your Instagram. So anyone that's not familiar with your work can jump on there and, um, and have a look. So Susan's asked, why black on white? Um, I'm not, I'm not afraid of color at all. So it's, it's a conscious decision because for me, it's about, I'm always looking at something and editing and reducing and, and I'm interested in the, the shape and the line and the texture, not necessarily the color, but the sort of tones of black and white. There's something really nice and simple about, it. I just love the aesthetic. It's something I really sort of aspire to there's something very binary about it about that black and white and i love these sort of hard edges that you can create um yeah i'm not shy of color at all i you know i have a very colorful home lots of colorful objects but the black and white is just about the simplicity of it um and sort of all these beautiful sort of tones. you can see from my board actually it's also very black and white i mean i'm very inspired by space and i'm a bit of a sci-fi person and so um yeah i love sort of looking at the stars and i like that black and white sort of vista it's about editing i think we're so visually overloaded with so much information and, and part of my work is about editing and reducing and taking out what's fundamental about what it is i like and quite often it's about the line it's about the texture it's about the pattern not not necessarily the color but i'm not i'm not afraid of color and i know how to use color you know i sort of fully trained in it and you know, I worked in retail and as a designer, so I worked with lots of sort of colour and, and interiors. So it's uh, nothing I shy away from. It's a very conscious decision to bleed black and white. And who knows, I might go back into colour. Again, there's a, this is a very well-known artist, Michael Craig Martin, and he was very well known for his black and white drawings of household objects. Um, you might you probably know his work. And uh, he's a British artist. And then when he was 50 or 55 or something, then he started to make colour work. And now no, he's more known for the colour work. So no one ever remembers the black and white work. So, you know, who knows? Maybe when I'm 50, I might be explosion of colour. It would be cool to see, but I'm not quite ready for that yet. I just want to keep you in black and white. I think it's just... <laughs> exactly. There's too much colour in the world. There's too That's much right. like, visual overload. I'm like, oh. So, yeah, it's about sort of that reducing and sort of editing for me how did you find your signature style or your style at the moment um i so i studied embroidery um at manchester did a whole degree in it but it was a very fine art textile degree and um i think i've always been really interested in drawing and um drawing with a black pen or a pencil it was the medium i had most access to as a kid um so I like the sort of drawing potential of embroidery, but actually it was more um, towards the end of the first year and I was um, writing an essay on, I mean, who I, I never thought I would write an essay on the history of black work. So I wrote an essay for my history of embroidery essay um, and I went to the V&A and discovered um, drawers and drawers full of um, Elizabethan black work embroidery. And there was a specific piece called The Shepherd's Bus 
Um, and it's a re really weird spelling of it. Um, so 16th century, um, quite sort of a relatively big piece of work, maybe 50, 60 centimetres height and width um, in the British galleries in the V&A. And um, it used sort of seeding stitch, um, so speckling stitch in black work, it's called speckling, but it's seeding, same thing. Um, and I saw the potential of it there. So I like that sort of signature aesthetic. Um, and I started to explore that in a few pieces of work um, at the end of end of the first year. So it really sort of started then. And, and I sort of pushed the process on um, more, so more obsessively um, and denser. So I'm trying to get the see stitch when you twist more you face, all the stitches are supposed to be the same size. And it's just a straight stitch. So you're just putting at this irregular sort of patterning. It's the pattern which defines the stitch that I do. But I've sort of transformed it into this very dense surface, almost like they're crossing over, but they're not, they're not touching. And yet they're so small and tiny, might have become almost like dots. Um, and I've always been really interested in rendering, technical drawing rendering. So I was able to just translate my sort of, um, uh, when I was doing, so when I was at high school, design technology, we had to draw car dashboards, you know, all those male things that you have to sort of draw, like a car, we had to draw the interior of a car with a black pen. And so you would have to try and replicate all those textures and patterns from materials with a black pen. So for me, I was able to take that and then transform that into um, stitch. So a lot of my cubes, for instance, take patterns from my environment say like the metal tread on the, the on a sort of a, on the floor and then replicate that pattern into stitch so i'm taking something directly and just translating it or re-describing it through stitch so there are real links to drawing and rendering and technical drawing um have i got the book with me here i just grabbed the book so look here called and it's a really fascinating book. And it was one that I learned how to draw with, technical drawing. And I'll just show you one page because I think it will make, it will make sense. You can see here, you know, um, taking one pen and being able to describe a multitude of different textures and patterns. Um, so the world around me, the, the built environment and transforming that through, through drawing. So I was able just to translate that directly into, into Stitch. So there's a, there's, a, there's a nice link between all of the work. I think it's hard to pin down the exact thing, but there's a, there's a nice sort of journey. There's a trajectory where one thing then influences another thing, and then all the dots start to join up, all the stitches, so to speak, and then everything sort of falls in place. So I pretty much defined that aesthetic um, right at the end, well, sort of in the second year of my, my BA, and it's become something very specific to, to my process. I mean, the materials are really important to me. I use, I use a very beautiful, um, heavy wool, different weights of wool. And I went through a whole process of discovering different fabrics. So I didn't just arrive at it. There was a whole like two years of exploration to try and find the, the, the right sort of threads and fabric. And now I'm sort of slightly obsessed with one specific thread and one fabric, but you know, I try other things and I'm, you know, I'm, pushing my sort of skills in different directions and collaborating with people and making different work. So yeah, who knows how it might change and develop. And now I'm starting to work in different colors. So, I mean, black and white, that's different for me, the other way around, reversing it. So let's see, let's see where this goes. Yeah, I really resonate with your work that you have up on your website in your shop, the the, the white stitch on the black. I think that's amazing. But um, the internet just dropped out slightly when you were um, showing your book cover. What what was the book called again? Sorry. Rendering with a pen and ink, revised and enlarged edition. Yeah. Great. Thank you, yeah. Richard. Really, really yeah. great book. Yeah. And, it was, and it was printed in, I think, 1979. So at the same time as another book, which I really love, which is the Constance Howard Book of Stitches. So really strange that it, both these two books were printed at the same time, and yet they are, there's a real marriage between them and a synergy, and I think that's really interesting that I'm both of them are my favourite. Yeah. It was a good year that year. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, yeah. It was a good year, yeah. I think it was. Yeah, yeah it was a great year, yeah. <laughs> what other stitches do you use other than tiny seed stitch? Thank you, Philomena. Um, well, I would say running, I would say seeding stitch is probably the one I, 
I go to all the time because um, for me, it is so versatile in terms of what I can do with it. So I can explain many different themes and create many different shapes and textures by just changing the density of it or the positioning of it or where it's going. But I, I really like running stitch is my favorite. I mean, I'm really interested in just basic stitches, nothing complicated at all. So running stitch and I really like couching. So I'd say seeding stitch, couching, and um, running stitch. And, and, and what I love about all those stitches, so I mean, running stitch and seeding stitch are essentially the same. Running stitch is straight stitches put in a line and then um, seeding stitch is lots of state stitches just put in a different sort of random order. Um, so they're essentially the same technique, but they're, they're really direct and expressive. And I like these very simple marks because they are like drawing. So there's nothing difficult or complicated about these processes. There's something very direct about the action that you're making. And I think that's what I like. You know, drawing is almost, and, and writing are, are those very direct body movements. So they're very intuitive and they're very immediate. And I think that's why I like seeding stitch and, and running stitch. But, but couching definitely is also really, um, yeah, really exciting. Mm. Glennis has asked, you're also making maps and is that still on the radar? Um, yes, I am making maps. I mean, uh, all my work is pretty much a map. So I'm mapping time, my time. Um, and so a lot of my work is are sometimes very abstract maps, so maps of a specific moment, um, so filling sections of time. But then I worked on a whole series of pieces of work, and this has been an ongoing series, and I think I'll always make them. Um, and that's a series of light abstractions. And this really, I mean, I started making these when I was doing my BA, um, you know, flying in a plane over cities and seeing these very abstract patterns made by us at this sort of macro scale. So when you're flying over, you see these, you know, we've all done it where we've, we've peered out the window and we see the roads with cars and you get these lovely trails of light and how these sort of cities sort of transform into these very abstract shapes. Um, and some of them are more familiar, like this one on the screen now is obviously London. I made this one for a commission. and But this one for me was not, um, I mean, I loved making it because it really challenged my technical ability in terms of the sketching. So this is all the same thread. And I've created and described the lights um, by just changing the density of the stitches. So the darker the areas, the lighter the stitches. So I'm always reversing it. And then where the white space is, where the negatives, so the parks, the river, that's where the dark is. So I'm reversing everything. Um, but for me, I'm more inspired by the more abstract patterns made by cities. Like this one, for instance, is Tokyo Bay. Um, and I think unless you live in Tokyo, um, you would never know that was Tokyo Bay. And I like that sort of confusion about what it is that you're looking at, because it's something, it could be something quite celestial or cellular. You know, it, you could be looking under a, micro, a microscope at a bacteria growing. Um, but at the same time, it looks like it could be like a celestial neighbor, uh, you know, um, a nebula out at space. Or, so I like that sort of idea of repeating patterns at different scale. Um, I mean, I really just was attracted initially by the pattern that it created about that black and white and the negative and the positive of it. And I've really pushed the sort of technique on now to sort of re-describe and give light almost a texture. Um, so when I'm making those pieces of work, I, I download pictures, images from the NASA website and they go through a bit of a translation. So I'm not directly trying to copy everything on there. I'm just trying to, for me, almost experience what I'm seeing and describe it um, through stitch on, on, on the fabric. Um, but what I love about those, those images as well is in a more philosophical way, it's having that sort of perspective because very rarely do we get that um, viewpoint to, to look at a place where we live at that distance. I mean, these are, these are images taken from satellites, from, um, from space, from, from around the orbit of from, uh, from Earth. So even if you were to fly over Tokyo, you would never get that distance and that perspective. And I think I, what I love about that vantage point is it sort of communicates how we live in the world and also how we shape and transform the world around us. So it gives us a sense of how much impact we're having on the planet. But also I think it represents a spe um, specific moment in time. I mean, obviously Tokyo Bay is, and I've abstracted it and taken what I wanted, but that's a specific moment, almost like stars are, 
you know, stars, the stars that you see um, are light um, from, from places, you know, from like hundreds or thousands mm. of years old. And so these light patterns of cities are, are from a specific moment. So they're almost reflecting back at me now in the stitch. And also the stitch is my time as well. So there's this sort of duality of the light and time and then also my time. Um, but also this vantage point is it puts everything in a little bit of perspective and it sort of reminds us that we are very tiny and that we are part of something bigger and actually, you know, not everything is about us. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well said. yeah Lorna says, um, love the way you research your theme with such intensity and passion. Mm. Thank you. I mean, everything is just about an interest. I mean, I'm just, I read and um, a lot of my um, sort of research just comes from reading, reading books and yeah, just being inquisitive, like looking and trying to understand a, a subject. Um, so um, yeah, a lot of, you know, life scientific or new scientist or, tr I mean, I'm really interested in the way things work, like how they function both that in a physical world, like how things come together, materials and objects, um, but then also how things work at this very microscopic level, but also at this macro level. Um, there's a really fantastic um, piece of work by Charles and Ray Eames called The Powers of Ten. Um, and that's a really way of looking at the uh, at perspective and this sort of repeating of patterns and the fact that actually we're all the same, we're fundamentally made up of lots of little dots. So we're, we're all atoms, just all in these different formations and organizations. And I like the way that stitch, like the stitch that I'm doing, it can be used as a metaphor for that. You know, I'm bringing all these stitches together to form something, but fundament fundamentally, we're, we're all the same. We're lots of little dots put together in different configurations and all that. And I think that's a really, nice way to think about like we're all the same where there's no gender there's no race we're all these dots just coming together in a very random way to form this quite unique thing it's really yeah again that's sort of mind-blowing for me yeah it's mind-blowing yeah. yeah and those little dots of energy they don't actually ever touch like nothing is solid that's what yeah, gets exactly. me as well. So um, there's an artist who I really love called Alicia Quadi, and she she says, "Oh, I actually don't even." Um, she's a German artist, and she um, she says, "I don't believe in anything actually, because fundamentally, the chair that I'm sitting on is really not here." And actually, um, in quantum physics, this is another thing when you're <laughs> not looking at, when you're not looking at something in theory, it's not actually there. It's only when you look at something, does it become the thing that you're looking at? I mean, I'm just like, what? So the sort of perception of reality, the way we experience the world is very unique to us as humans because outside of our little, very thin layer of life on this planet, everywhere else, it's different, you know? Yeah, and is the artwork actually complete without the viewer? Is, well, I think all our works are, they come alive or they perform with the viewer. I mean, I don't really like to load my work with too much stuff. I mean, it, it, for me, it, um, the concepts and things are really important to me, but fundamentally I like quite often it's, I'm first visually attracted to something, you know, so I like to make something beautiful and nice and interesting and then, and then it's the next layer of uh, sort of info. But yeah, you're right, is that work there? I think most work like sculpture um, only comes alive when the person is viewing it like with anything, you know? So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated cycle of physics and quantum physics and perception, I think. I've got who a knew? couple of, hey? I was gonna say, who knew Friday night would be um, <laughs> science night? I know, I need a drink. <laughs> 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 oh my god and please don't quote me on anything physics because i just don't know <laughs> so i just this is all the stuff that i'm trying to like digest yeah yeah there's a couple of practical questions in the feed but before we get to them i wanted to ask you and it probably flows on to what we've been talking about what do you think about when you have like when you're stitching when you spend so many hours stitching what do you, where does your mind go um Joe, you know this is quite a good question because 
uh, as much as I love the process, I also hate the process. I have this sort of real sort of like, conflict with it, the fact that it takes so long and yet I can't seem to detach from it. Like the, there's a desire to be there. So I feel like it's a compulsion. I'm almost overtaken by the process. So um, yeah, I always have this sort of conflict about that it takes so long to make a piece of work. But then there's something nice about that slowness. But what I try to do, because it's quite, it's a labor intense process. So potentially a work again might take me a year to make. Um, and if I'm sitting for eight or nine hours, it does create a sort of sense of physical space, but also mental space. But then what happens is because it's so monotonous, it sort of relaxes you. It allows you to think about everything, which is not always great a place to be because you can overthink. So I tend to distract my mind with many things. So quite often I have to have a podcast on or I have to put on friends from series one and watch you know, all 13 series, just as a way of sort of distracting my mind, because you could almost, you know, sink in and overthink something. It's like going for a run, although a run, you really got to think more about your breathing. So that's a nice way of distracting. That's why, re that's why running is so relaxing. I, I would say that stitching to a certain point is not as relaxing as people who do it purely as a hobby. I mean, I like it. And it is, there is a way of sort of being present, which is very nice. But when you've got a deadline or anything like that, it's sort of, yeah not that relaxing <laughs> so there's a lot of things i'm thinking about um but i tend to try and distract my mind from that with science podcasts or podcasts about does time exist is this the real <laughs> reality <laughs> you know all this sort of crazy stuff so what i'm doing is as i'm think as i'm making i'm also thinking about those ideas that i'm exploring in the stitch and i think there's something really nice about stitch and like, i mean like the back of stitching for instance i've got here um, so you can see the back, have I got, there's a camera. So the back of yeah. stitching is very different to the front. So what I love about the back of the stitching is that here we have this very, um, you know, very neat, tidy sort of view of the stitch, but on the back, it's completely crazy. And then that can be sort of a metaphor for life. There's like, we're on the surface, we're all very neat and tidy, but on the back, we're a bit of a mess. Um, but then also, um, I love that the back of the stitching looks like Brownian motion, which is the motion of an electron. So if you Google Brownian motion, um, you'll see that it looks like uh, it was a very famous Einstein um, uh, experiment where he tracks the motion of an electron and it creates the same almost pattern on the back of the stitching. And I think that's just serendipitous. So like, I like so, uh, so I'm finding sort of connections between, you know, thinking about life, but then also thinking about science. Yeah. I love that. That's in, that's incredible. I posted something once about the different, like when you look at a tear underneath a microscope, if you cry tears of happiness, they have a different different molecular structure to tears of sadness or happiness and the patterns that they create. Wow. It's, in, it's incredible. There you go. It might be your next series, tears. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to check that out. I'll, yeah, I'll, check that I'll, one out. I'll credit you. I'll credit you. <laughs> no, you don't have to. No, seriously. <laughs> I just thought, you know, like just those little things that I, I I feel like I do need to distract my mind and I'm listening to an astrophysicist at the moment on, um, a, a, it's not a podcast, it's like, have you heard of Masterclass? It's the it's the videos that they do and, um, yeah, it's, it's just fascinating. Um, yeah, sense, yeah sense I, think it's really, I, think, I think it's really interesting to be inquisitive about the world. I mean, I'm not really a believer. I mean, I just believe that, you know, we exist and we're only here for a very short amount of time and then poof, we're then we're not here. So yeah, make the most of it. Mm. Yeah. Well, your work will still be here. Yeah, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um Marion's asked, um, what thread do you use? Um, so do I have it here? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really a fancy thread person. Um, so I just use a black cotton. That's it. It's a quilting cotton, I think, so it's a bit stronger, um, but it's just a black cotton. Nothing fancy at all. I mean, that's what I used to do all my other stitching with. But then when I'm, and then I, have I got something else? And then just like, um, you know, just this, the standard sort of embroidery thread, but obviously in black, not blue. Yeah. Um, so I use that. But that's it. I've quite a minimal use of thread and stitching. Yeah. Very, very minimal palette, very minimal tools. Yeah, people are always disappointed 
because they're like, bring along your tools and everything to show your process. And I bring along a needle and a piece of thread. But I think that's great, you know, that you don't need, what's what I love about embroidery or textiles, it's so accessible in terms yeah. of medium. It, everything else you have inside you is just time and imagination and the sort of will to do it. I think that's the hardest part sometimes is just finding that to push through the barrier and just get on with it. Which sort of leads us on to Philomena's question about the physical limitations of, of your craft. And she's asked, do you get any RSI symptoms from doing such long hours? And what exercises do you do? Yeah, um, well, it's quite important to stay active, I suppose. So I'm sort of, yeah, I, I do try and stay active. But I have suffered in the past quite quite a lot with a bad shoulder just from stitching. But I think just because I just learned how to sew in completely the incorrect manner. So I've sort of looked and researched into the correct way. And then I did a workshop the other day and um, someone sent me a link about the ergonomics. There's a, a guy or someone who's written a book called The Ergonomics of Knitting or something. So I'm going to have a look at that because essentially there's a lot of stuff that can translate. But yeah, I suffer quite a bad sort of shoulder. And this is from doing sort of this process all the time, going backwards and forth. So that's, a bit, that's quite a trick. Um, and when I did that project with... The 60 cubes um i did lose the sort of strength in my left hand from holding the fabric essentially for yeah for long periods of time like just physically holding the fabric in my hand um sort of caused me a lot of injury i mean i know when to sort of stop now so i can sort of feel it coming on so i just have lots of breaks really i mean the rule is 20 20 20 which is and also your eyes um, so sort of protecting my eyes um, so to stitch for what 20 minutes then look away 20 feet for 20 seconds I mean I think that's how you sort of protect your eyes but just getting up so I tend to walk around when I'm stitching I've got a high table I just change positions all the time so I don't the worst thing for you to do is just to sit and slump in a chair for six or eight hours so you know every hour something I'll, I'll move I'll move around but it's it's hard because sometimes eight hours will disappear and you haven't eaten or moved so yeah as I said the time sort of changes or shifts usually hunger strikes that's when you usually know you've got to move mm. it's funny how you were saying that 2020 20 and my mind instantly went to that's 60 <laughs> oh my so, god yes there we yeah. go it's a magic yeah, number come. yeah yeah so we're coming up to an hour almost. We've got eight minutes. Um, 60 minutes. So, oh, I love that. It's all just, it's all linking perfectly. It's all, it's all yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was going to ask you, if time was no obstacle for you, what would you create or what would you work on? Um, I'm work. oh, gosh, I don't know. I think time is a really interesting thing and I think, if we didn't, um, if we had lots of it, then I think we'd be quite boring people. I think the the strength of us having limited amounts of time here is a good thing, um, which is also scary why people just want to be older and older and live longer and longer. I think it's about, yeah, if I had a lot of time, that's a very difficult question. I don't know, just to keep stitching and to see what the process might lead to, because I think I love that sort of transformation. I'm making a piece of work now, and the idea is that it's another circle, but a big, big sort of circle. And the idea is just to keep filling it and and just seeing what it might transform into. Um, I mean, like anything, time is my. You know, I always there's uh, Lenore Tawney. She's um, a very famous um, artist who used textiles. Friends with Agnes Martin, part of that sort of whole 1960s abstract minimalist sort of group. She um, she quite famously, I think she said that time was her medium. And I think, yeah, I really like that idea that it, along with my thread, time is also sort of that, 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 that medium. But yeah, maybe just to keep pushing it, filling it, filling a space and seeing what it might transform into. But um, I don't think anyone should have unlimited time because can, could you imagine Trump with unlimited time? That'd be just a disaster. So I think people have too much time, it turns into disaster. And especially in politics, you can see where that happens. Russia, America, you know, disasters. Disasters, yeah. What about the concept of time is money? 
And how does that relate to being an artist? Because I, the thing that I hear about a lot, especially in the textile fibre arts world, is that because it is so labour intensive, how do you then translate that into the financial reward or the financial or the value of a piece? Yeah, well, it de it depends where you are um, positioned, and that's when we have to talk about market, which I hate. Um, it depends where you are in your career, but market value, um, and specific specifically within craft and fine art. So within fine art, you definitely get more for your for your money and you get more money for your art. So if it's art rather than like applied arts, like you're making something that you might use, there's sort of a perception of value. And I think textiles has come up a little bit, but there's still that sort of perception of textiles as being domestic, amateurish, um, and so a feminine. And then that almost devalues, it, it, sort of, it sort of devalues it, only in the West, I would say. But there's still that, yeah, it's very hard to sort of cost your work up. It's really, really tricky. but. You know, I'm not making it because of that. And I think, yeah, it's it's going to get better. But it is, it is really, really, really tricky to price work. That takes so long to make. Yeah, if I was to, yeah, charge like an hourly rate, I mean, I don't make, yeah, I don't make profit. I mean, it can't be about that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested. I mean, it's definitely helpful if you've got money. Um, and sometimes I wish I had more so that, I could just spend all my time making work, but yeah, it's uh, it's a tricky thing. Does that answer your question? I don't think it did. I think I circumvented that quite quickly. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's a hard thing to talk about. I think you know the value of work and, and I just think yeah, textiles, especially, especially on that, but. yeah, textiles as a medium. I think there's a perception of value, and because of our relationship with textiles in general, because of fast fashion, because it's so readily available, we can get cheap stuff from China, everything like that. There's a there's a perception of value within textiles which is lower because it's so it's everywhere, um, yeah, and especially sort of the value of embroidery. I mean, definitely sort of the lowest of the low. But I think there's something really wonderful about, it. and I don't see any difference between that and drawing and painting. For me, it's exactly the same, and I think that has changed um, a, a lot. Yeah. Mm. Do you get a lot of people imitating your work and copying your work? Well, it's very tricky um, because I, I teach a lot, which is fine. And also, you know, what I'm teaching is not mine. You know, I everyone learns from somebody. So I've been inspired by something. And then I think, yeah, quite often people do it, but then quite swiftly move on um, from it. Um, so I think, yeah, I think as artists or as students, we're, we're always learn. I think the best thing to do, first of all, when you're learning something new is to sort of copy, but then move on very quickly because you never want to be a pastiche or a copy of, of, of someone else. And I think if you are your own individual person, um, it comes out in your work and your experiences of life and your environment that, that feeds into your work. So. I'm not too obsessed about that at all. And I, I think um, hopefully when I'm teaching, I just want everyone to sort of enjoy the process. But yeah, there is a fine line of sort of inspired by and then copying. I mean, I've definitely had one or two occasions, um, yeah. My daughter was is lucky enough to come and, and she met you and she was super, super inspired by your work. And I wanted to show you this. <gasps> See, that's amazing. Great. <laughs> Isn't it great? I mean, this yeah. was a couple of years ago, a year and a half, so she, she would have been about tw uh, maybe 12, 13 when she did it. But, it's, yeah, she loves it. It was summer, so, wasn't it? Was it summer? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, I love it. I, I wanted to put, like, a, a picture of yours up and a picture of hers up with a little nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> She did. She totally has. She totally has. Yeah, yeah. Just so you know, she's moved on to something else now. She's really beautiful watercolors, and you know. But you know, this this was her. You, you were her inspiration. Yeah, that time. I think you know what people have a go is they usually have a go and then quite quickly move on because yeah. sometimes it's like, oh crap, that takes a long time. You've got to really want to. You've got to live your life in it. It becomes almost an obsession. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So for the last question of the night, if there was something that you'd like to be remembered for or a quote that you, you know, and I gave you the heads up on this, so, you know. I know, you know what? I think this is <laughs> ah, come on. Uh, yeah, what question, Tommy? What quote would you like to be remembered for or, or what would you like to be remembered for as an artist? It doesn't have to be necessarily 
Um, if someone what, was to think of Richard on a bumper sticker, what would it say? Um, take no I think take notice. You know, be, I think always take notice and perspective is a really important thing to have in, in your life. So perspective in terms of like, yeah, what you can be grateful for. But I always think perspective is really great. Like I always say, whenever you, um, if you have an argument with someone or you feel angry about something, let the world go around once and then, and then address the problem because it never has the same sort of energy. So I think that sort of distance and perspective. So yeah, slow down and enjoy the moment. Mm. I love is that. that. Is well enough? Is that all right? Yeah, I think yeah. I, I, that's not new either. I stole that off somebody. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, that, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're like 35 seconds over an hour. So I think we did pretty well to keep it to that. Oh, I wanted yeah. to keep it to that 60, <laughs> 60 yeah. minutes. Oh, we've, that's it. The end of the world is going to happen now. We're going to fall into this kind of vortex of time. That's it. The we black can hole. <laughs> Yeah. Black hole. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to play a little outro video, Richard. And for everybody watching, please put you, you please thank Richard for his time. Um, it's extremely valuable, and we feel very, very privileged to to have you online tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs>